Uh, hello out there. What's going on, everybody? You don't need to see my resolve just yet. Let's go to my full, beautiful, rapidly aging dad face due to, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blame the sleep that I've been getting for the last year. Hi, everyone. It feels kind of quiet in here. I feel like it took a minute to get uh, for me to figure out where I'm at uh, with the live stream here, and I think it might have needed to be flipped over to public or something like that. Anyway, I see everyone coming in now. Hi, I hope you guys are doing great. I'm doing really good. I'm having a really fun week. Lots of color grading and lots of color sciencing in the background and like fun tools and uh, new schemes and stuff that I'm cooking up for making images look better than ever. Uh, lots of fun stuff that I'm excited to share with you guys. And uh, of course, I'm excited as always for our Friday morning grade school session. Hope everyone's doing awesome. Hope everybody enjoyed this week's video on working with the texture pop tool. That's something I don't think we've talked about like at all here on the channel. So uh, I was excited to dive into that. Although I have, uh, as everyone is finding their way in, I have a couple of housekeeping things, one pertaining to this week's topic and another one pertaining to the other big thing that I'm working on right now. We are gearing up for the next round of the Colorist Career Accelerator. I'm also missing a co-host at the moment. Oh wait, Rafa's here. Everyone hang on, I have to go get the door. Rafa, you're coming in hot. You're coming in live, buddy. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the mistake because we changed the hour in Europe tomorrow. No, the last week. Oh, dude, it's the, these the time zone thing is is brutal. Can, can I, I, I feel like um, is it like controversial to 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 say that like I don't like daylight savings time and I don't think we should ever change the clocks for any reason ever. Mm. I'd say it is because I actually enjoy summertime a lot more than the winter. Oh, you're one of those. Okay. Yeah, I, I like my sun, so right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like, I guess because I'm an early riser, like, I always start grumbling around this time of year because now it means it's an hour later before I can get out and play any golf. Um, but that's hardly a scientific reason against daylight savings time, although I guess there is, there are people saying that science says, but I don't know. I'll just be, I mean, I'll put it to you this way. I, I, I opened up grade school today talking about my uh, rapidly aging dad face. That was a brutal Saturday night. Like, oh, hey, no big deal. You're just going to get one hour less of sleep. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I've got hours of sleep to spare. No problem. Not so much. Anyway, glad you're here, buddy. Um, oh, it seems that people cannot hear me for some reason. Oh, hang on a second. Let me, we, we need to hear all of Rafa. Stand by. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, we're not gonna hear Rafa for today, so I will. I I will repeat questions uh, as we go through. Anyway, glad you're here, and I'm glad to be talking to Raphael, even if I have to convey his his witticisms to the rest of you guys. Anyway, we got a lot to talk about. I'm going to dive in. So, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, so we were talking about the Colorist Career Accelerator. It's coming back up. Rafa's going to be there with me. My dude Gadali's going to be there with me. It's going to be an awesome time. This is the third time we are putting on that course. I'm really excited about it because we are about to open for registration. Uh, and as uh, you guys know, any of y'all, especially who have taken the course before, any CCA alums in the house, give me a shout in the chat. Um, any of you guys who've taken uh, the course before know how fun it is to actually go through the entirety of what it means to operate at a very high level as a professional colorist in a structured way. I love hanging out with you guys on YouTube. I especially love hanging out with you guys on grade school because we get to spend a little bit more time on a focused subject, but that's one hour. The Colorist Career Accelerator is four days of four hour sessions that is basically the result of me sitting down for like a year or more and saying, okay, how do I pack everything that I wish I'd known earlier in my career into those four days. So that's what it's all about. It's all about, as the name indicates, accelerating your colorist career, whether you are at the very beginning of that journey or whether you are well into that journey and you feel like you've hit a plateau and you really want to punch through that wall, reach that next level. That's what the course is here to do. Uh, we talk about color grading. We talk about conform. We talk about setup. We talk about negotiation. We talk about bidding. We talk about delivery. We talk about literally everything that's involved in running a professional color grading business because it's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of varied things that you need in that toolkit. 
so super excited for that. Um, we are going to be releasing uh, a video actually after uh, this episode of Grade School today because we were so uh, focused on the Color Screw Accelerator this week and getting prepped for it that we weren't able to get that video out sooner. So you can look out for another video after Grade School wraps today. Uh, and that one's going to be super cool. But back to uh, CCA, it's coming up. If you are interested in taking your career to the next level, uh, there's a link to our first dibs uh, waitlist in the description for today's video. Make sure you hop on that. We've sold out every time that we've put up this course uh, within uh, around 36 hours. So uh, if you want to have a good opportunity uh, to uh, join the course and uh, see if it's right for you, definitely encourage you to be on that waitlist. And one of the other fun things about being on that waitlist and getting in early is this time around, for the first time since we've run the Color Risk Career Accelerator, I'm going to be providing for uh, the first people who uh, join the course in uh, the uh, first day a uh, set of three tools, DCTLs, that I use like every single day in my color grading practice that really help me to finesse my images. So that's a nice bonus as well. Uh, anyway, if you're interested, check out the waitlist and uh, or check out the link to the waitlist so that you're in the loop uh, when we open for registration very, very soon. Okay, let's talk about the texture pop tool. So before I dive into everybody's questions, I'm gonna adjust my resolve UI a little bit here. And I'm going to make a confession to you guys. I made a mistake. I messed up. So those of you guys who've been here on the channel for a little bit know that I switched after being like a diehard serial node guy for like years and years and years, my entire color grading career. I finally got sold on the merit for a variety of reasons of using what you see here, this parallel node structure where I've got primaries up in this first row and I've got secondaries. Uh, that I do down below. And you guys may know that as things get more complex, I'll even treat these rows kind of as individual, uh, you know, like separate tracks. And I can even add more parallel mixers down below if I need to. Um, but I bring this up right now because when it comes to this week's subjects, working with texture, working with spatial operations, a really smart person here on the channel pointed out that's not the ideal thing to be doing in a parallel node structure because of the interaction between these layers. So this is a big adjustment that I'm making in my workflows that I'm going to encourage everyone to make in your workflows. In fact, there's going to be a video coming out about this very soon, but you guys are getting a sneak peek. From now on, I'm going to be doing any texture based manipulation downstream of my parallel node structure to ensure I don't get any weird interaction between these layers. And just to give a quick example of that, you can actually see if I do like a really aggressive blur here, there's going to be an odd interaction between the two different branches of the parallel node. So we want to avoid that. Uh, and the best way to do that is to not operate those in a parallel node structure. So you can kind of see that those edges are sort of holding on when we look at uh, the two branches of the node graph. So I'm going to advise going forward that we do everything textural downstream. That's what I'm going to be doing today when we talk about uh, working with the texture pop tool. Um, what else? I feel like that's plenty of talk out of me. Um, let's go to my guy Rafa and see if we've had a chance for any questions to come in yet. We have a question here regarding ACES. And the question is uh, regarding ACES 1.3, uh, he's mentioning that Ari Log C has a wider gamut than ACES. So doesn't it make Log C a better intermediate core space than ACES? Uh, maybe to add to that, to that question, what's the difference between AB1 and AB0? Yes. Short answer. Yes, it does. Um, this is something that, you know, frankly, I was disappointed by when I... Um, was looking at the uh, forthcoming ACES 2.0 standard, I was really hoping that the AP1 gamut that Rafa just referred to, the AP1 set of primaries, which is like the normal operating space uh, or, or, you know, like intermediate space when you're working in ACES, I was really hoping that would either be changed or just done away with in favor of some other standard. Um, but no such luck. We're still stuck with it. And just to get a quick visual on this, let's go to our scopes here. And I'm going to go to the chromaticity diagram here. I don't really use this when I'm grading uh, for a variety of reasons, um, but for the sake of demonstration, it can give us a good visual, I think. So you can see this CIE horseshoe here. If anyone isn't familiar, this is basically 
a 2D representation of a 3D uh, thing, which is the full range of human vision, basically. So anything inside of this horseshoe is stuff we can see. Anything outside of it is stuff we can't see, right? So you can see within here, we've got the triangle for Rec. 7 or 9. So this is an additional boundary within the spectral locus, within the CIE horseshoe, which is all the colors we could possibly see. If you have a monitor that shows Rec. 7 or 9, that means you might very well have a visible color out here, but your monitor can't show that color. Makes sense, right? So that's what a gamut effectively is, is a set of, it's a triangle within the horseshoe, essentially. And the bigger the triangle, the more of uh, the full range of human vision that uh, that capture device can grab or that uh, display can reproduce, okay? So that's how Rec. 7 or 9 goes. Let's just look at some other gamuts here. So let's look at area wide gamut 3. Area wide gamut actually goes outside of the spectral locus in some areas. And even though it is deficient uh, up here in this kind of cyan region, uh, it's a much larger gamut, obviously, than Rec. 7 or 9. And to go specifically to the question, if we compare area wide gamut 3 to ACES AP1, you can see that indeed ACES AP1 is somewhat smaller than area wide gamut 3. Now, the only caveat that I'll make here, we're getting kind of color sciencey today, but uh, I, I, I feel like. I feel like I'm among friends. I feel like you guys don't mind getting a little geeky on color science for a minute. The only downside I will say to using area wide gamut three and saying area wide gamut three is a better color space is that you have with AP one, you really don't have what are called virtual colors, meaning colors that aren't visible to the human visual system, except over this, you can see kind of up here in this little upper right hand corner of the triangle, you can see there's a little bit out that like of triangle uh, of like real estate inside the triangle that is outside of the horseshoe. But in general, we're well inside of the horseshoe. If you look at the area wide gamut three, there's actually a lot of stuff that is outside of the triangle, or outside of the horseshoe, I should say. That can get kind of tricky because it's like, well, what does that mean? And what the heck do I do with those colors? Um, but setting that aside in general, more coverage of the horseshoe is better than less coverage of the horseshoe when you are talking about a working space. For that matter, when you're talking about a display, if a display could show all this, do I want to see it? Yeah, yeah, I'm game. I'd love to see that. Uh, typically, displays can't perform nearly this well, but for a working space, the wider the better. So is that a better working space? Yes. Um, and what does it mean that AP1 has a smaller space? Well, uh, actually, before I answer that question, just the final point of comparison, uh, let's look at AP0, which is the other ACES primary set or ACES gamut, AP0 essentially completely encloses the CIE horseshoe. So that's cool, right? So that's what that's what AP0 does. That is the like the big archival space. Like if I tell you I want ACES linear, what I really mean is AP0 with a linear tone curve. But in general, when we're working in ACES CC, ACES CCT, ACES CG, which is like the linearized uh, version of those for VFX exchange, all those are going to be inside of AP1. And AP1 is a smaller gamut, so you can have issues arise uh, as a result of that. Um, and, you know, really just to kind of round that out, we talked about this here on the channel before, but that smaller gamut, the fact that AP1 is smaller not just than airy wide gamut 3, AP1 is smaller than quite a few gamuts for like cinema cameras, like reds and aries. So because that is the case, you can end up with the famous aces like neon artifact or blue light problem. And we talked about that here on the channel. That's what the gamut compression scheme in aces 1.3 was designed to alleviate. It's basically a way of saying like, hey, if I, you know, like, let's just do a quick kind of like experiment. If I have a camera, and I'm out there shooting pictures and I go out and I'm shooting a, a big dramatic night shootout with a bunch of cop cars, okay? You're gonna have values that are like way up here in that cop car shootout. They're gonna be up in that like very cyanish range and you're gonna have values all in this area kind of right at the edge of area white gamut. And when you flip over to AP1, some of those values are going to be out of bounds for AP1. So if you don't do anything about that, you get artifacting, you get clipping. The ACES 1.3 gamut compression scheme is basically a way of saying, hey, if I've got a color point out here in my source gamut, meaning like in this case, area wide gamut three, let's smoothly compress that to the closest match that I can give you inside of the AP1 boundary, which depending on how you do it is gonna be roughly along this edge.
Okay. Um, so we could do a full, like, you know, like I could set up an ACES pipeline and we could visualize some of these things, but I think that's plenty enough of a bite uh, for today in terms of thinking about those two gamuts. But yes, AP1, I would say that is, especially when, you, when we get into ACES 2.0, when there's like a brand new display transform that I think is a huge improvement, the AP1 gamut being smaller than many camera gamuts is like the biggest remaining drawback of the ACES system. I hope it's something that gets remedied in the future. Because other than that, I think ACES 2.0, there's a lot to be excited about. And none of this is to say you can't or shouldn't work in ACES. I just think that all color management frameworks have their pros and cons. And the first and biggest con for ACES is certainly having a working gamut that is smaller than many camera gamuts that requires gamut mapping. What else we got? There's a conversation here about the order of operations. And basically, what's your thought on where to pull certain effects slash curves in the node tree? And also, there's a conversation behind that one uh, regarding texture. Where in the node tree, where should we put blur or any kind of sharpening? Oh, cool. Yeah, a bunch of good questions here. So we're talking about order of operations. I forgot uh, last time to repeat Rafa's question for those of us who can't hear him, which is everybody. Um, so what we're talking about is how do I think about order of operations in general within Resolve? And specifically, how do I think about the placement of textural things like blur in my overall pipeline? This is a great question. So I'm going to give you guys some uh, like principles uh, that I apply. The first one is this. I... There, there are two orders of operations that we should really delineate between. There is the sequence that we actually make our adjustments to the images in is number one. So as an example of that, I typically w am going to prefer to make an exposure adjustment here in node number one. I want that adjustment to happen to the image before I make a contrast adjustment to the image. There's a bunch of reasons for that. We can talk about why uh, in another conversation, but that's the actual order that I want those operations to take place on the image in. Does that make sense? That's how, sort of like definition one of order of operations. That's the most typical definition. But there's another sort of like interacting element there that I really like to clarify. Just because that's the order that I want those things to happen in, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the order that I, as the colorist, am going to want to work my adjustments in. I might, I mean, this is not the case for me, but I might want to do my contrast adjustment first and then make my exposure adjustment in terms of what I do chronologically first, second, third, or last. You follow what I'm saying? That's a small distinction, but I feel like that's an important one. There's order of operations on the image, and then there's what we could say, we could call chronological order of operations. And here's the first, like, the, the reason I emphasize all these things, here's the, the first, like, sort of rule of thumb I want to give you. Unless there's a reason for those things to disagree, I want them to agree. So I don't want to, I don't want to have to think about what I just said any more than necessary. So as a result, what that means is I think about chronologically what I want to do and the, you know, like how do I decide chronologically what's important? What should I do first, second, third, or last? Uh, that's, that really goes back to a chapter of my book, The Colorist Ten Commandments, greatest gains for least effort. So wherever I am in a color grade, whether I've done no color grading or whether I'm like in my fourth pass and we're making finishing touches, I am looking for the next most impactful operation. Okay. So simple example at the beginning of a grade, I'm going to do exposure before balance because exposure matters before balance. Exposure is going to have more of an impact on my image than balance. They're both going to have a big impact, but exposure is going to have more of an impact. So for that reason, I'm going to do exposure before balance. Now, let's go back to my first point. When I say that, just because I, I, want, I want chronologically to adjust my exposure before I adjust my balance, does that mean that exposure has to happen on the image? before balance happens on the image. No, those two things can be different, but they shouldn't be unless there's good reason. Why? Because it's complicated. That goes to another chapter of my book, The Colors 10 Commandments, uh, simplicity beats complexity, okay? So unless there's a reason for me to 
do my adjustments in one order, but uh, or to to uh, make my my adjustments as the colorist in one order, but to change the sequence of those adjustments in the node tree. Unless there's reason, they should just agree. Just make it simple on yourself. And I'm going to argue to you in Resolve a lot of the time, whatever chronology you want to work your image in, the impact on the node graph that's going to be fine. Like. We've talked about this here on the channel before, this exact example of like, well, should you do exposure or should you do balance first? You wanna know the truth? It doesn't matter. Like, it matters for your practice as a colorist, which you prioritize first, because one is going to give you more impact, it's gonna get you closer to where you wanna go than the other. But in terms of like, do I do my exposure first and then my balance after that? That doesn't really matter. Like, I'm not saying the results are gonna be identical, but what I am saying is, you're just going to get you're, you're going to use your eyes to get the result that you're looking for. It's not like you're making a compromise one way or the other. So that's kind of a long spiel. But that's an important one is there's order of operations in terms of the sequence in which we affect our adjustments on the image. And there's order of operations in terms of the chronology, the order in which we tackle things as the colorist based on what we think is most and uh, or least important. Okay. In general, make those things agree, make it easy on yourself so that you don't have to think about this uh, 10 minute pitch that I've just given you. Now let's talk about textural stuff. Here's what I would say about textural stuff. This kind of feeds right into what we're talking about. Texture is important. That's what we were talking about in this week's video. You can do really interesting things with texture. Texture for me falls toward the end of my process chronologically as the colorist for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not going to have as much impact as good exposure, good balance, good contrast, good spatial contrast, like even with power windows and things like that. It's generally just not going to have as much impact as those things. So that lowers its priority. All right. Um, that's really the main reason uh, why I am going to do textural stuff later. There's also the fact that textural stuff falls kind of lower on the list when we look at the simplicity test. Texture stuff is more complex. Like when I say sim simple versus complex, the best example of simple that I can think of is offset. Those of you guys who've color scienced with me or on your own before know that offset is literally addition and subtraction to the incoming pixels. It could not be simpler. So that's the ideal place to start. If it can get you what you want, if you can get you closer to where you want to go, that's the ideal place to start. Texture, meanwhile, is bloody complicated doesn't mean you shouldn't use it, but it does mean that if there's a simpler thing that can get you what you want, you should use that. So those are the two reasons why for me, in terms of order in which I think about things, order in which I tackle things, priority as a colorist, texture is going to come last. So if we connect that up with the principle that I've just given you, what does that tell us? That tells us that unless you have a specific proven reason for sequencing your nodes in a different sequence, then your priority as a colorist, put your texture stuff last. So if we had to bundle all of this up into a very simple uh, answer to the original question, how do I sequence my order of operations? It doesn't matter much. So it might as well agree with your order of priority as a colorist. And then specifically, where do I place texture in that order of operations? I would place it dead last. I feel like I talked about that for a while, but that's really good stuff to discuss. We have more questions about texture. And the, te the question is reg um, regarding the texture for tool. And a couple of questions here are about creating weird edges, color spilling out. Uh, I guess that means color artifacts. When using it to create smoothness on an image, why does that happen? So the question is about using texture pop and about getting unexpected or undesired results, artifacting, weird edges, strange things happening with the texture pop. So, and what do we do about that? Why does that happen? Is uh, what I'm hearing in this, these questions. So there's some great things to, to cover here. First of all, we just talked about this a moment ago. Texture pop is complicated. It is not simple. So like I can give you that I can tell you exactly what's happening with offset, like it's addition and subtraction texture pop. I know that it involves whatever pixel you're currently looking at evaluating the pixels around that and then making a weighted adjustment and redistributing uh, the value spatially uh, of those pixels. That's like a really kind of naive definition of blur. 
But specifically, what's happening inside of the texture pop tool in Resolve when I move one slider versus the other, it is A, complicated, and B, even if I was of a mind to understand all the nuanced complexity of that tool, I can't. There's no documentation of like, what is the math that's going into the texture pop tool? I can't. So I can make some reasonable inferences based on how texture manipulation works in motion imaging, but I actually can't know exactly what's happening. So those are two things to be aware of using the texture pop tool. It's complex and it's a black box, okay? So why do specific things happen in specific scenarios? We actually don't exactly know. You can start to detect patterns and know when certain things are likely to happen and when they're not, but really the best thing you can do to get good results consistently and to avoid problematic results is to make broad observations of the patterns that you see and observe to some observe some best practices and principles when you're using texture pop. That's why uh, in this week's video we talked about you know really the simple principle that uh, I offer up. Like this is honestly the way that I use the texture pop tool when I'm grading. I'm going to move this texture pop tool over downstream of my parallel node. And if we look at our uh, different sliders here in the advanced mode of the texture pop tool. I generally don't go above rough and coarse. Those are the ones that I feel like get me the most naturalistic reproduction or the most naturalistic adjustment, I should say. And they don't really cause problems. Like contrast that with like the tiny slider. Honestly, any image, if I hit that thing too hard, any image is gonna look weird. Like I know we're looking at this over YouTube, but like, that's, I guess that's not technically an artifact, but it's posterized for sure. Like that looks insane, you know? So like on a good day, under the best of circumstances, this is a knob that like, if I hit it too hard, it's gonna do weird stuff, you know? And that's not even pulling up a specific edge case where a specific image is really reacting strangely. So that just tells me like, hey, these knobs, like maybe they'll get you something interesting, but you always run the risk of doing something odd with them. So all of that is kind of the reasoning for me behind like just sticking down here to these lower registers where I've yet to, you know, in any of my work with the texture pop tool, I've never seen any edge artifacting or weird behavior when making sensible scale adjustments down here in the lower end to rough and coarse. And basically as you click up from there, your results are gonna start to get less and less natural feeling to my eye and more and more prone to the kind of artifacts and uh, problems that we are talking about. And the last thing that I'll mention on this is, this is definitely something that like any other grading operation uh, in Resolve, you're gonna have much better luck if you are operating within a color managed framework like I always encourage here on the channel. If you're doing this like in Rec. 709, for example, you're gonna be that much more prone to artifacting unnatural uh, you know, adjustments and uh, problems when you use this tool. Hope that's helpful. It is a good idea to set an RGB curve node at, let's say, 50% strength to modify more easily its behavior? Oh, this is a good question. So the question is, is it a good idea if you are making... I'm going to turn my, my global look off, or I'm going to turn my... my uh, tone foundation off for a minute here at the timeline level of my node graph so that I can make a curves adjustment because the question is if I'm drawing my own curve and I want it to be a little bit less touchy a little bit less sensitive can I simply set my key output gain to say 50 percent and my answer would be yeah absolutely that's a really great trick in fact I don't think I have it in any of my sort of like current working node graphs that I've been working with lately, but you could actually do this. Like I know colorists who in their template node graph, they might have, for example, their balance node. They've got the key output gain in the template node graph set to 50% for the exact reason you're talking about, just because it's less touchy and it allows you to make, to have less response for every unit of movement uh, that you make with your mouse or with your control surface. So yes, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Uh, and a, a great way to control like how touchy your uh, adjustments are. And that's literally the same thing. Like if I, I'm trying to think of a uh, great way to explain this. Like if we look at the, at the curves, 
I'm just going to rough this out. If I move this down to here, like so, like right down to this, uh, why am I looking at just my red? I don't want to see that. There we go. If I move this like to a specific position and then I decide, oh, I only want to go halfway there, this is exactly the same as doing key output gain at 50%. So yeah, it's a very easy, clean way of modulating uh, the intensity of your adjustment. So yeah, absolutely, great idea. What else we got? Have we I was mute. So if uh, the footage engraving has a mute palette, how would you go about popping it a little more? How would we go about popping things a little bit more if the footage has a more muted palette? Well, here's the first line of defense. I'm trying to think if I've got, I guess all the images in here, you know, like this image is a fairly muted color palette. So here's a first principle to think about. I feel like this has come up in a couple different ways uh, here on the channel recently. We have like the two big buckets, like there's lots of nuance here, but the two big buckets when we think about like, how am I going to pop a grade? How am I going to make my grade eye-catching? The two big buckets for that are color and contrast. Those are your two tools that like setting aside, you know, like your creative intent and your, your taste and all that stuff and what the material is, generally speaking, the more contrast you have, the more like, you know, if you set your contrast to zero, I'm going to walk right by that TV and not even know that it's on. Okay. If you set your contrast to like 200%, I'm going to at least turn to the right. And that's really what like, you know, best buy mode of the TV when you buy it from best buy, that's what it's trading on. The image looks like crap. It's crushed. It's clipped. It has nothing to do with what the authors intended when they mastered that image, but you can't argue that it doesn't catch your eye. It does. That's why those images are cranked that way because they're trying to outdo the TV to the left and right of them in the Best Buy, you know? So contrast is number one. Generally, the higher you crank the contrast, the more eye catching it's going to be. That's not the only thing to consider, of course, but that is a reality. Same thing with color. The more colorful it is, the more eye catching it's going to be. And of course, as colorists, we want to arbitrate that with our taste. But the reason I, I mention all this is because those are our two biggest buckets. And while it's not sufficient to only think of things in terms of those two big, broad, dumb buckets, it can actually be helpful to return to those broad categories when you're asking a question like, if I have an image with a more muted palette, how do I make it pop? Well, what that means in terms of like your initial assessment, the way you're thinking about the image before you even begin grading it is like, well, I'm going to have a limited ability to grab the eye with color because I don't have a ton of color in this image, right? So where does that leave me with? Contrast. So that's the broad answer there is like, if you have a more muted palette, you're gonna need to rely more on contrast because you can introduce contrast uh, and you've got a little bit more flexibility there than if you truly have like an image with super low color separation, you can keep cranking that saturation but it's still gonna be monochrome only more so, if that makes sense, as opposed to having lots of color contrast, which is really what I mean when I talk about colorful. I'm talking about color contrast. I'm talking about spanning different quadrants of the vector scope. Uh, you know, like if we think about that compared to like, let, let's just say that, you know, the baseline for this image is actually here. If I just keep saturating that, that's not necessarily gonna make it more eye popping this also doesn't look good, but uh, it's not going to make it more eye popping necessarily because it's just one color. Okay. So that's what I would think about. And the reason I went to this image in the first place is because this indeed has a kind of a fairly mellow palette, even though we do have a, a kind of a decent harmony of the background against our subject's skin here. But what I would look at for like an image like this is, uh, I mean, in this case, I could literally just turn my tone foundation from my Voyager uh, LUT pack back on. And that's immediately going to give me more pop, right? not really changing the colors that much. It's mostly a contrast adjustment. That's what this tone foundation is there to do. So if you've got a more muted palette, rely on your uh, 
contrast. And here's the other good news. If you have a muted palette, that means you can do something that often doesn't work when you have more colors. It's like, oh, if you want to add saturation, you can maybe get away with like just straight up normal sat, you know? Like that actually does work fine because we've got a little bit of color separation here. So don't be afraid to reach for that knob and you know push things as far as you feel like your taste will allow. And then if you pair that with a contrast adjustment, that's gonna start to get you into uh, the, the optimum position for making that image really grab the eye uh, for uh, whatever your application is. Most of the look we got in digital color grading represents the print side of the film. So can you please describe the negative side of the film and how can we include that thing in our look building process? Ooh, this is a fun thing to think about. So the question is, a lot of the f character uh, that we get from a film system in terms of color reproduction comes from the print side. That's that, that's uh, what the person asking the question is saying. And that's, uh, that's true, uh, it, generally true. Um, so the question is, well, what about the negative side? What character does capturing on film negative impart as opposed to capturing on a digital sensor? Like what are the things that we should be looking at or, or looking to emulate if we're trying to get the negative side of things. I'm gonna give you guys my take on this. So it's really two pieces, but there's one piece that's really important for me. N on the negative side, what you are getting more than anything else when you compare capturing negative to capturing digital is you are getting an initial sort of like rolling of your shadows and highlights. So if we think about like, let's just do a quick example here. Let's look at just this tone foundation LUT. I'm gonna go to a um, grayscale ramp. Like so. And I'm gonna go to a waveform. So if I do this and then I bypass my color management so that I'm not actually looking at the output transform, this curve here, this is the creative contrast that's being imparted by this Voyager Tone Foundation LUT, which is from my Pro, Pro Pack and happens to be called Orion, okay? You can see like we've got an increase, if I turn this off and on, this is like sort of classic like uh, S-curve type stuff. Look in the middle here the slope, literally how steep the line is. Like think about slope, like skiing down a steeper uh, mountain or snowboarding, if you guys do that. The slope increases in the middle here, right? But then at the upper and lower boundaries, we are rolling off like so. That's an, the character of pretty much any S-curve, certainly the character of a film print. But what's interesting when we focus on the negative is the same basic thing happens in the negative the only difference is like if you wanted to like really get geeky and color manage a negative, which I've done plenty in, in my career where I'm like, no, I want to like, I've got this captured neg and maybe I want to do something other than just slap a, you know, traditional uh, film emulation LUT over top of that and grade underneath. If I wanted to do something else, I want to manage it into a grading pipeline. Well, the foundation of input transforming any camera, film or otherwise, when we're color managing, you can think of it essentially as like, well, we just want to get back to a linear relationship of all the original tones, right? Well, with a film negative, even if you linearize so that you no longer have like a slope increase, you've got a, a, a unity slope here with a film neg, unlike if I were to linearize, say, log C3 or something like that, you're still going to have this and that. You're still going to have a roll off at the bottom at the top because film is an organic material and that's just what it does as it's climbing out of zero and as it is approaching what's called the uh, D max of the film negative, like the greatest density that can be encoded by that uh, material. So you've still got that roll off. What does that all mean aesthetically? What that means is that you are going to get a sort of compounded softness or roll off in the image. And this actually came up uh, in some comments here on the channel recently where someone was asking about like, uh, I think we were looking at uh, the look dev series that we just finished going through where they're like, wait, 
you're adding a contrast curve. You're adding an S curve, but there's already an S curve that's coming from your color management, isn't there? And I said, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm a big fan of stacking S curves. In that case, it was stacking a creative curve on top of a technical curve. But in the case of a film to, uh, you know, like a film emulation system, you can think of it as essentially having a negative curve with roll off at the top and bottom. And then if you're doing your own film emulation or whatever creative look, you're probably gonna do another creative contrast curve on the other end, and you're gonna stack that up. And the net result is gonna be something that for me, I'm almost always looking for when I'm color grading, whether I'm calling it a film emulation or not, which is strong mid-tone contrast, but lots and lots of softness, lots and lots of shape in the very bottom and in the very top of the image. This is actually something that uh, I, I think I recall my friend Jill Bogdanowitz calling out uh, when we were talking about working with Lutz here on the channel in an episode of Grade School, where w she was talking about like that core characteristic of a film LUT, where you've got strong mid-tone contrast, and then you've got lots and lots of roll off and softness in the top and bottom. So what is a negative contribute to the aesthetics of that system? More than one thing, for sure. But to me, the most noticeable thing when I look at those systems is like, oh, it's adding another hit of softness, of roll off in the bottom and in the top of the image. And if you wanted to do that, you could you know, look at using my Voyager LUTs as a foundation. You could build your own look like we talked about in Basic Look Dev last week. And then if you wanted to get sort of like a negative idea into the image, you could play around with the idea of like here at the very head of your node graph, like go into your custom curves and what I would try is just doing roll off here at the top and bottom, like so. So don't necessarily mess with the midtone slope at all. I'm adding another control point just to ensure that sort of stays locked there. That's a weird thing with these curves is sometimes you can, you know, when I draw a control point here, I really, my, my preferred behavior would be that everything in between here and there is locked, but it doesn't quite work that way with the custom curves. So yeah, you might have to add a second control point, but you're basically gonna be adding another layer of softness or roll off on the negative side. So that's a long answer, but hopefully a helpful one for kind of thinking about the contribution of negative uh, versus print to the aesthetics of uh, a, a, an image going through a film system. Let's go to CGI and VFX. When you, your color footage, when you're color grading footage with VFX, like a CGI character, do you want to grade the final VFX shot or grade the plate and then match the VFX to the plate? That's a good question. So the question is when you're grading a, what I'm gonna call a synthetic asset, something animated, something generated, computer generated, do you, or, or Rafa, actually, let me make sure I'm understanding. Are we asking about a real world shot with a CGI element in it? It says like a CGI character, but I think that works as well. Basically two different elements. Okay, but one of those being like a real world element? Is that, am I understanding that right? It doesn't specify, Okay. so well, whatever. Okay, cool. Yeah, so essentially what we're asking about is what do you want to work on if you're grading something that is going to go through VFX or maybe you're grading, uh, you're grading something that combines more, multiple pieces that are ultimately going to need to be integrated and then have a unifying grade on top of them. That could be a real world element and a generated element. It could be a, comp I, I guess that, that's what I'm going to assume the question to me and that you've got some mixture of those two. I'll give you my answer. I think all parties to the creative process should have maximum context. I kind of feel weird sometimes for like how impassioned I get about the word context, but I'm not gonna lie. I am passionate about context. Here's what I mean when I say that. VFX artists, if they are compositing something or if they are whole cloth generating an asset out of nowhere that needs to live within the world of uh, the film or show that I am grading, they should have the opportunity to see what they're doing rendered through my lens, through the lens that I'm creating with my client. So they should, first of all, of course, not have to just look at it in log, 
but they shouldn't even just have to look at it with like a stock camera LUT or a stock ACES transform applied to it. They should be seeing the pipeline I'm gonna be using. That's what maximum context for them would be. On my side, when I am grading, I am also gonna want maximum context. So if it is a, if the final version of the shot is going to be a combination or a composite of a real world element and a generated asset, ideally I would have that to work with right off the bat because that for me would be maximum context. Now, I don't have to have that. I can grade the plate or I can grade, uh, you know, just the real world element knowing that that other element's gonna come in there. And if we have a good workflow in place, what that means is that the only thing that changes when we update that asset in my timeline is the CG element itself, is whatever effect is being produced by the VFX artist. And then I can simply reevaluate that image with that fuller context and make any adjustments that I or my client deem necessary now that we're seeing the final image. But definitely the ideal scenario for all players when you are, uh, you know, like creating and mastering motion images is maximum context. And you guys have heard me talk about this with uh, people on set as well. Same exact principle. Like, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think it's cruel to ask a DP to expose an image through a stock camera LUT and then wonder why it doesn't look beautiful when we run it through a completely different pipeline when we're color grading. It's because they, because they had super low context when they were shooting, right? If we'd given them more context, they would have been able to make better decisions as a result. And I think that holds across the entirety of the production and the post process. So I'm always an advocate for maximum context for everybody and for thinking of ways ahead of time that we can provide that context uh, to everyone involved. Let's go back to the order of operations conversation. What about the noise? Uh, from your noise video, I saw you put the noise reduction in a secondary branch, but shouldn't it come before everything, including the primaries? I've seen people using it even before the the first color space transform. Yeah, I mean, I f the question is about noise reduction and where that slots into the order of operations that we were talking about before. And I feel like some of this we've talked about before, but I'm always game to take a quick, fresh lap through it. I, this this is one of these like you know sort of like I guess controversial or contentious takes I have. I see people use noise reduction at the head of the node graph all the time. I hear people talk about it all the time. What I don't hear is why. Why is that ideal? Why would you ever want to do that? I've never heard a good explanation for why you'd want to do that. Absent that explanation, my preference again. I'm just going to go back to like what should order of operations be. Well, unless there's a reason to do something else, order of operations should match my order of operations as the colorist. So where does noise reduction fall in terms of my priorities as the colorist? Pretty low. If I'm counting on noise reduction to save me, I got problems. Noise reduction is not gonna save me. Noise reduction might get me three, 5% improvement in my image, but the 30, 40% gain, that's gonna come from exposure. That's gonna come from contrast. That's gonna come from balance. That's gonna come from guiding the eye with power windows. That's gonna come from the overall look that I create. If I'm expecting noise reduction to save me, I got problems. So noise reduction comes much later in the chronology of my process. So then the question becomes, is there any reason why you wouldn't want, is there any reason why noise reduction should be placed in terms of order of operations mathematically in Resolve, is there any reason why it should come in a different place? And like I said, I've never heard anyone give me a good reason why that should be the case. I think it's just one of these viral ideas that gets transmitted of like, oh, well, you just put it there because, um, and I, I don't see a reason to do it. In fact, I think, in fact, I see a reason not to do it because remember, noise reduction is blur. Noise reduction is essentially damage to your image. It is, you're, you're, you're like, yeah, you're, you're, you're beating up your image with noise reduction. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but I would argue it does mean you probably don't want to be grading that beat up version of the image. You want to be grading underneath your noise reduction and then placing it in your node graph in the same position as your priorities dictate, which is later, downstream, after the fact. That's my take. All right, another question regarding texture. And um, we have talked about every single tool, mid-tone details, uh, classic blur, but we haven't covered uh, the contrast pop tool. 
is there a reason why you don't use it as much? Yes. So we're asking about the contrast pop tool as another specific, uh, you know, like element within uh, res another specific tool within Resolve. I'll be honest with you. I've the reason I haven't talked about it here on the channel is because I've like actually never used it in a grade. Like, let's open it for like the third time I've ever opened it here and just see what it does. Detail amount, detail size. I don't know, maybe that's interesting. Low threshold, high threshold. Now hey, you're giving me something to think about. I don't wanna make you guys stand here while I explore for the first time. Maybe there's something in there worth exploring if we think about it as a texture tool as opposed to what I always assumed it, I've always assumed it is, which is some sort of contrast finesse tool. That's my, the real reason is because I feel like I have uh, my, the things that I'm looking for in terms of finessing contrast, I have either in the primaries and resolve or with my custom tools. Um, so when you tell me, oh, here's a contrast pop tool, I'm like, I'm good. I know how to pop my contrast. But it seems like just from that quick evaluation, maybe it is more of a textural thing. And maybe we should do a video on that. So thanks for bringing that up. All right. A uh, question here regarding AI. And um, basically the question is, what are your thoughts about AI and text to basically, text to concept, text to something happening, uh, tools that might come in the next, basically days at this point? It, are you saying text to concept? Yeah, basically uh, every every kind of AI that works put into some kind of word and then something happens. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that in terms of the color pipeline? Oh, I see. Well, you know what's interesting? This is obviously being discussed and is a big point of interest for uh, all of us in the color grading sphere right now. And to repeat uh, the question, we are asking about AI and about all of these, you know, like input a command input some you know like plain language like we do with chat gpt and get a particular result that, that's kind of the the avenue of ai that we're talking about right now and we're asking about like well what are the implications or the the possibilities or what are what's my take on how that uh what that has to offer to us as colorists um like i said it's a point of keen interest right now and i did see my friend dotto valentic just recently did a interesting live stream where he was exploring some of those possibilities and to be honest with you, I haven't looked at those things uh, in detail. Um, I would say there's, I'm trying to think of a succinct way to frame this conversation. I'll give you a couple thoughts. First of all, whatever the mechanism, whether you call it AI, machine learning, whether it's driven by, you know, like inputting an explicit command or a simple like under the hood analysis of what's being done to predict what should be done in the future, whatever the mechanism, if there's a thing that a machine can do at and match my level and match like what I'm trying to do without me having to do it, I'm game. I don't care what that is. Like I don't, I don't care what aspect of my job it is replacing or making redundant. I don't care how exactly that happens. I'm for it. Like, if you take away the entire discipline of color grading from me because AI can actually do a better or equal job of it to me, I'm fine with that. Like I'll go find something else that AI can't do. I'll go find something else to occupy my time. I have no shortage of uh, curiosities and uh, adventures that I wish uh, I, I had time to go on in my life. I will say that what it seems like to me, and I, I'm not super well read in on everything that's happening with the chat GPT stuff right now, but what it seems like to me is all of this stuff is being seeded. Like I'll give you this example. I think one of the demos that I'm most interested to check out that Dotto did the other day is something along the lines of like, you ask chat GPT to generate a film print emulation and then it does it. And then you have a viable film print LUT. I haven't seen this firsthand, so maybe that's not as, maybe it's not as uh, simple or uh, dramatic as that. But I don't think that that's impossible, that that could be a thing. Um, and if so, that's pretty cool, right? But here's the thing. What's the seed of that? The seed of that is a film print emulation. The film print emulation represents a century's worth of R&D and trial and error by humans. That's the same reason why we're interested in film print emulation in general is because it represents a body of knowledge and research and expertise that we've still got to 
spend another 60 years catching up on on the digital side if we want to match what was w arrived at in film, right? So what I'm saying is like, I feel like that's the, 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 a part of the conversation that is sometimes being missed with AI, whether we're talking about color grading or anything else, is like, that's great if AI can solve this problem or do this or do a, a really good mimicry of that, but what happens if you take away, what is the seed of that output, of that product, of that solution that's being offered up? If the seed relies on humans, then I would say, I guess for now, I, I'm not gonna be retiring from color grading anytime soon because we're gonna need humans to come up to produce those seeds still. Um, I don't say that from a, a point of being threatened or thinking it's wrong if the AI can actually produce that seed from its origin point, but that is something that I see a lot with these AIs is like, isn't it so exciting that AI can make a, can write a song that sounds just like the Rolling Stones or whatever silly example you might come up with. I'm like, yeah, that's great, but it wouldn't be able to get very far without the Rolling Stones. So for the moment, I think we need people. Um, and for anywhere that we don't need people, that you can prove to me that uh, people can be removed from the chain and that you're not just capping out the capacity or the creativity or the ingenuity of what's being done by the best of what people have done up until that point and the AI is just matching that and never surpassing it, um, then I'm all for uh, utilizing uh, the tool. But I do think there's uh, a worthy distinction uh, to be made there. So if AI can r like take away some uh, redundant work and make things a little bit smoother and give me a chance to focus more on finesse, I'm all for that. If AI is standing on the shoulders of other humans and never surpassing those, uh, the, like what those humans have done and we are calling it the genius of AI when it's really just repeating something that was pioneered by a human, I think that uh, is a more shaded conversation and it's maybe not as exciting as it initially looks. My two cents. I'm open to hear you guys' thoughts on that too and I, I uh, am excited to check out uh, some more of what's going on, like specifically with ChatGPT, because there's it seems like some interesting things happening. Uh, I'm just curious to see exactly, exactly some more of that stuff firsthand. I would say. All right, we got time for one more. Let's go to a more human topic. How do you go about getting inspiration for a grade? Uh, the question might be like, if your client has an input versus if the client doesn't add something about it. And what did you do for your personal projects, like your short films and basically non-client work? Great question. Great, great place to close. What do you basically, what do you do for inspiration and what do you do if the client doesn't have a strong take and you're driving the bus, you're really being asked to bring ideas to the table, or if you're doing a personal project and it's your thing and you get to decide all of it. Um, more than one question in there, I guess, um, in terms of finding Inspiration, what I have found in my career as a, you know, like visual artist, I'm always consuming images. I, I find images like uh, intoxicating in and of themselves. It's like I, 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 I was like writing about this the other day, but like, you know, there, there's that old expression like, oh, there's no such thing as bad pizza. That's how I feel about images. Like just the act of looking. I find intoxicating. Show me a crappy image, I'm still gonna get a little high off of that. I'd rather have the really choice stuff, but I just, the act of looking itself, I find intoxicating. So I'm always doing it. I'm always getting high on looking at images. So because I'm always doing that, I always have at least one or two or three things that I'm obsessed with. And I'm like, ooh, that thing. That, that thing, an example of that could be, wow, how do they get that strong mid-tone contrast, but those really soft shadows, like we were just talking about a minute ago. That thing could be, wow, how do they get those reds that feel so deep and dense and rich? That thing could be anything, but at any given time, I've usually got two or three of those things bouncing around in my head that I'm like, that's, that's like my whole world at that moment is like, I want to be able to get that. So usually when I'm looking for a, a when, when I'm like, when I'm having to, when I'm looking for inspiration, that's the bank that I'm going back to is like, well, let's see which of those two or three things kicking around in my head might be interesting for this project and let's see if I can apply them. That's just the honest truth. Those two or three things change all the time. So like, I'm gonna bring different inspiration in a different context 
to different grades depending on the time that you asked me for that. And then uh, related to this, the other question about like, well, what do you do when it's your personal project and there is no client to weigh in? Uh, I, 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 I cry. I, I, I like argue with myself a lot. It's actually really hard for me, just full honesty, after a career of working with clients, when there's no one in the room to bounce ideas off of and to like arrive at the best result with through collaboration, I struggle. I actually, I find that it's really hard for me to do that in a vacuum because I've got too many ideas and nothing to bounce them off of. So I like collaborating. And that's not to say if you're doing your own project, you can't collaborate with someone, but I'll give you this example. In the couple of times that I've made films, you know, I, I was an editor before I was a colorist. And the couple of times that I've, uh, you know, like directed films, I realized, oh, I actually need to hire an editor. Not because I don't know how to edit, but because it's too overwhelming. I lack the perspective and I also need to be able to put the thing outside of my brain, if that makes sense. So I, I guess like to give you this, the short answer, what, what would I do? Like maybe what would I do today? If I were grading a project that I had just gone out and shot, I'd probably hire a colorist um, just for the opportunity to get things outside of my head and to turn an internal like pondering into an external collaboration. Um, so hope that's a, a helpful thing, a, a good thing to uh, close on for sure. Um, okay, guys, that was a cool session. That was kind of more of a freestyle session. We didn't uh, talk explicitly about texture pop, but... Glad we got to cover some textural questions. Great questions about order of operations. Lots of fun stuff uh, within there. So uh, great session. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the session, we have another video that's going to be coming out uh, after grade school wraps today. So you can look out for that. And uh, if you are interested in taking your career to the next level, like we talked about at the beginning of this session, the Colorist Career Accelerator is opening for registration super soon. We're going to be doing it in just a couple of weeks here. I'm really excited about it. If you're ready to take your, your career to the next level, if you're ready to make that investment in yourself, uh, definitely check out that wait list and sign up so that you can be in the loop for when we do go live with registration and you can check it out uh, when we do. Like I said, we always sell out, usually within the, <clears throat> excuse me, usually within the first 36 hours. So uh, if you are uh, serious about getting in there or at least getting the opportunity to make that call, then get on the, that first dibs list and uh, it's going to be a really fun time. Rafa's going to be there. Gadali's going to be there. It's going to be a, a great couple days. Thank you guys, as always, for sharing your Friday morning with me. Love hanging out with y'all. Love talking about color grading. And you guys give me as much to think about as I hope I give y'all to uh, think about in your own practice. So thank y'all very much. Have an awesome rest of your Friday and an awesome weekend. And I'll see you soon.